All right, I'm back, I think. Oh, yeah, there I am. Hey, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm back. And so we're going to pick up there from our scripture reference. Um, and we give everybody a chance to get back, log back in. I know you guys had to log you off, log you back in, all that good stuff. But you guys are so faithful. I know you're going to follow. So hold on there. Come on back on if you were on. Get back on. And let me read the scripture and have some prayer and get us started for tonight. And uh, we'll let the Lord take us from there. All right. Scripture references from this evening, as I shared with you just a little while ago. Um, scripture references coming from James chapter 1, verse number 5. And the word of God reads as follows. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And without reproach, he will give it to him liberally. That is great news. Great news, great news, great news. Well, let's pray and uh, we'll get started in here in just a, just a second. Father in heaven, we bless you this evening. We thank you for a great and glorious day that you've blessed us with today. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives, even right now. You are such a good and such a wonderful God. And we're praying this evening, God, that the time of our uh, chat will be informative. Uh, it will be rich. It will be uh, timely. Uh, it will help us, God, to uh, receive that wisdom that we have sought you for. And so, Lord, I just pray that you will bless um, Sister Lat uh, Latasha tonight and just bless uh, each person listening. Uh, that their ears might be attentive to the words that are shared, the information that is given and gleaned, and we will bless your name for all that transpires. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and we thank you. Amen and amen. All right, now, here, here's some um, information for you. And again, James chapter 1, verse 5 is where uh, we're given a basis for our scripture, because uh, every... Friday night chat. I always like to have a basis for our scripture so that we know, um, you know, that what we're talking about is based in scripture. Not preaching or anything like that, but at least have some basis from where we are deriving our conversation. And so tonight, as I want to talk about um, vaccine hesitancy, um, I know that there's a lot that's been going on this week as it relates to COVID virus. And I do want to remind, remind us that we are still in a pandemic. Did you know that? There's still a pandemic going on. And so there's, here's some information that I um, kind of pulled off line, and, you know, it's ever-changing. So if it's not exactly right, give me a little grace because it's ever-changing. But I did discover today, as I pulled this off of line today, that 65%, I think it is, somewhere around 65%, and that number has been given different numbers, people have given. But let me say it like this. Let me back up. 267 million people have received at least one vaccine in America. That's the number I got offline. <laughs> and um, 154 million uh, have been fully vaccinated. I believe that's the number I got offline. Now, my expert tonight is probably going to correct all this data that I'm giving you. But, hey, bear with me. It's Friday night chat with Pastor Sterling, so I get to say what I want. No, 52%, 52.5% of Marylanders, we are here in Maryland, the great state of Maryland, and 52.5% of Marylanders uh, have received a vaccine, uh, somewhere around 5.46 million doses have been administered in Maryland. That's not that 5.64 million have, are completely vaccinated, but that's how many doses have been given out. And guess what else is happening? Uh, uh, CDC has given out some, uh, loosened some recommended guidelines um, this week. Um, in terms of recommendations, their recommendations, loosening things up. Uh, some people are shouting for joy. Um, and as I was sharing earlier, some people want this thing to be over, but they don't want to do what it takes to get it over. Okay? It's, it's got some things we got to do. So I'm not going to steal Latasha's, Latusha's, Latusha. Natasha's joy um, tonight. But anyway, I just want to share some stuff. So anyway, um, some people, in light of all the information I just gave you, even though there's been millions and millions and millions of people that have already been vaccinated um, and are still in the process of getting vaccines and blah, 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 there's still a lot of people who are skeptical, and we understand that. We respect your skepticism. I understand that. Still a lot of people who are waiting and uh, who are scared and untrusting and all those kind of things. So 
Uh, at the end of the day, there's just still a lot of hesitancy is going on, and it's going on all over the country. It's going on amongst all kinds of people and all kinds of populations of people, and there may be some variations here or there, but everybody, there's people everywhere that have different reasons and justifications for their hesitancy. And so for those of you who said, you know, hey, I want to wait till you know, some other folks you know, get the vaccine, well, about, you know, what did I say? 267 million people have already, so, you know, there's been quite a few people ahead of you uh, in line. But anyway, that's just another thought. But um, tonight, I do have to help us address our skepticism and our fears and our anxieties about the vaccine. I have a, a professional that is here with us on tonight um, uh, to handle our chat and give us great information. Because guess what? I also understand that a lot of people in the process of their hesitancy, they have been praying, they've been asking God, and they've been saying, Lord, I, I'm waiting for the Lord to show me, and I'm waiting for the guidance from the Lord. And that's why I was drawn to that scripture tonight. Um, if any man lacks wisdom, he asks of God, who gives it liberally. Now, the wisdom that is given doesn't always come directly from the mouth of God, but it may come through people that God speaks through for the purpose of edifying us. And so tonight, that person is none other than Latasha Leslie, who is uh, of the COVID clinical response team for the Department of ha Homeland Security. She is, uh, she has a master's degree in nursing. She has an RN in nursing. She has a BSN, bachelor's degree in nursing. She has all the nursing degrees and certifications, and she's, you know, board certified and registered and all the other stuff. She's, she's top-notch nurse, okay? She's got all the medical qualifications, and she's serving as a senior medical advisor for the COVID clinical uh, response team for the Department of Homeland Security. So she's got all the credentials that would uh, help give great answers. And she'll tell you about her briefings and all that stuff and how she comes about all her information. She'll, I'll let her tell you all that. She's also a member of Kettering Baptist Church. And so guess what? Even amongst our own body, God has provided great wisdom, great insight for us so that we can uh, help defray some of our skepticism and uh, probably some of our hesitancy as it relates to this um, particular virus. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sister Latasha Leslie, and she's going to share with you all kinds of information, answer all kinds of questions that you may have, um, because she's already heard them before, so she's probably going to answer them in her presentation. And I believe towards the end, if we can uh, field some questions, we'll give you an opportunity to send a few questions over Facebook, and then we'll shoot those questions to her. We'll get those questions to her and get some answers for you. All right. All right. Sister Latasha Leslie, right. welcome. Thank you, Pastor. Just going to move to the podium. Good evening. As Pastor mentioned, I'm Latasha Leslie. I'm a member of Kettering Baptist, been a member for about 17 years. And I'm just grateful that Pastor has given me this opportunity to speak to my, my church family. Um, here in Maryland and wherever you are. Um, thankful to the internet, we have members all over the, the country and the world now. I am a registered nurse by training. I work for the Department of Homeland Security. I am a senior medical advisor and I'm on the COVID response team. I've been on the COVID response team since last year, January 2020, when COVID first, um, the pandemic first began. What my role involves on the COVID response team is developing the contact tracing program and managing contact tracing because we still have individuals who come into the office or still required to work and may have contracted COVID or been exposed. So we do contact tracing. We've developed contracts for testing and actually conduct testing of our workforce on a regular basis as well as um, vaccinations for our workforce. Thank you. Vaccinations for our workforce. Could I lay that? Oh, hold on, let me get my, right. Vaccinations for our workforce in which we worked with the, the Department of, um, hold on. Oh, the Department of Veteran Affairs to make sure our DHS workforce is vaccinated. Now the DHS workforce consist of um, various components that have um, frontline responders and healthcare providers who have not stopped working due to the pandemic and are still working in the public. And those will be individuals you see at the airports, the TSA agents who take your baggage and screen your bags, the Customs and Border Protection who takes your baggage and screen when you're coming 
from an international flight into the country. Um, Secret Service, individuals who protect our, our president and other high-level um, government dignitaries and, and officials, as well as the United States Coast Guard and um, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, that's ICE. Also, um, Immigration Services and several others. Now, our workforce consists of about 250,000 individuals. 150,000 are on the front line and have been on the front line throughout the pandemic. So you can imagine the exposure that they come across on a daily basis. So in my responsibilities on the COVID clinical response team as a senior medical advisor, I am responsible for fielding any questions those individuals have, making sure that our workplace is safe, whether that is in the buildings or wherever the workforce are responsible for working. So on my job, I provide these types of sessions along with another, a group of clinicians on the COVID response team. So I offer to do this for our church because I think it's very important that you get honest information and facts about COVID because yes, COVID is scary and the information that you get may get from social media or may get on the news with the 30 second news clip or, or, or less than that. Usually only focus on things to catch your attention, which are mostly things that went wrong or things that aren't going well. So I just want to share with you the facts so that you can make an informed decision about being vaccinated because that is a personal choice to be vaccinated. So I like to um, help you make an informed decision. I'm going to run through a lot of frequently asked questions I've received um, during my role of the past year and a half working on the COVID response team. A lot of concern individuals have is that the COVID vaccine was developed too quickly. I've never heard of a vaccine developed that quickly. So I want to share with you what actually entails for the, the process of developing a vaccine. Any, all vaccinations that are developed require a strict, rigorous process as defined by the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health and the Food and Drug Administration and the third, third party advisory committee, third party non-governmental entity. So all vaccines undergo phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. Phase three clinical trials is the bulk of the work. Okay? Once you get to phase three, you know that you have a, a for sure product that can be um, possibly moved on to market like the vaccines that have received emergency use authorization to date. Now the phase three clinical trials for all of the, the three COVID vaccines that are on the, that have received emergency use authorization had a overwhelming amount of individuals to volunteer for the clinical trials. Typically a phase three clinical trial usually has about 5,000 um, participants. The Pfizer vaccine had 45,000, Moderna 30,000, Johnson Johnson 43,000. Because people were eager to do their part to be in the clinical trials to help us get to a solution quicker, a vaccine solution. So the benefit of having so many individuals in a clinical trial way more than a typical clinical trial would have, means that the researchers were allowed to ac have access to more data. The more data you have, the more variations in the individuals in the trials um, based on their age group, their race, their gender, whether they had any pre-existing medical conditions, that allows more signals or more information to be used and accessed, thank you, to be used and accessed and then to detect anomalies, to detect issues, to detect side effects, to detect if, medic, if the vaccine is safe or unsafe, safe and effective. That's the purpose of the clinical trials, to determine safety and effectiveness. Now you'll hear terms thrown around efficacy. So the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine have a um, mid 90% e efficacy, Johnson & Johnson 66% efficacy. So some people were saying, 
I, I prefer to wait for the vaccine that has the highest efficacy. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, they set the parameters for efficacy. Vaccines, all vaccines only need a 40 to 50 percent efficacy to be proven as efficient and effective to prevent or minimize the communicable disease that they are targeting to for prevention. Pfizer vaccine had 90, 92%, Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson Johnson 66%. Now that is, those all exceed the threshold set by the Food and Drug Administration, the 40 to 50%. So, and, and the goal of all three of the vaccines prevented severe illness from COVID shown in clinical trials and hospitalizations and deaths. Okay. That, so all the vaccines, despite their efficacy, you know that the efficacy is above the threshold of 50%. So that's why they're shown to be safe and effective. Now, you may be aware that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was put on pause maybe a few weeks ago for about about 10 days because there were um, individuals who contracted a rare um, blood condition, um, clotting in their, their blood and also um, bleeding, low platelets. And some of the individuals, um, two individuals passed away. They were females and the number was up to 15. But Johnson Johnson has been reviewed and put back on the market with that warning that it may cause this rare condition. That condition was so rare that initially there were six women out of six million doses. Six million doses, yes. So it was really less than um, less than one in a million because those six million doses weren't all women, just the women who came down with the rare blood condition. So the risk versus the benefit was weighed and reviewed by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. That's the independent third party body of experts um, making the advisement to the Food and Drug Administration on um, whether or not, the Food and Drug Administration and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, whether or not the vaccine is still effective, whether or not the risk versus the benefits of the rare blood clotting was so low that the benefits of still using the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the population during a pandemic outweighed the benefits, outweighed the risk. So you, you do have options when it comes to vaccine. You have the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Johnson & Johnson. The Johnson & Johnson requires one injection. After 14 days of your, that one injection, you are considered fully vaccinated. What fully vaccinated means is that your body will be able to mount a, an immune response if you contracted COVID and you are very, 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 very unlikely to get sick and be hospitalized and die from COVID. The Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna requires two injections. Moderna is 28 days after the first injection. You get the second injection. Pfizer is 21 days after the first injection. And yes, you must get both injections in order to complete the series to, so that you have the benefit of getting vaccinated. One dose of the vaccine does not make you half vaccinated or half safe because the efficacy and the, and during the clinical trials was not assessed to identify what happens if you only get one vaccine. It was intended to be a two dose vaccine. So you have to go back and get your second dose and you need to get your second dose on the three, day, the, the three weeks or four weeks after based on which vaccine you receive. Now, what happens if some, I get this question, if you miss a few days of your vaccine appointment? CDC has said that it's still safe to go and get your second dose of the vaccine, but make every effort that you can to go get the vaccine within that allotted amount of time. Okay. When you go back to get your vaccine, Make sure you take your vaccine card, and you will get a vaccine card after your first shot. If it's Johnson & Johnson, you have 
You don't go back. You get your one dose and you're one and done. With Pfizer and Moderna, please take your vaccine card back with you to get your vaccine because that vaccine card is important. It has the lot number and the type of the vaccine that you receive as well as the date. Okay, That's an official record. What to do with your vaccine card after you've gotten your second dose or your first dose of Johnson Johnson. Take it home, put it in a safe place, make a copy of it, a hard copy, and store those in a safe place with your paper copy of your vaccine card, and also take a picture of it and keep it on your phone. Do not post your vaccine card on social media or share it around, take pictures and share it around with others because there are some bad actors out there that may try to counterfeit your vaccine card and also take your identity. Your vaccine card has your name and your date of birth on it. That's um, information that someone can use to um, take your identity with a, a few more added elements um, to that you know, so be careful where you store your vaccine card. Remember where you store it and don't share it around. It's not recommended that you um, laminate your vaccine card. At least for the, the site that I went to get my vaccine, the nurse said don't laminate it because on some of the stickers they put on the vaccine card, they have a barcode. So the lamination was um, skewing the barcode. So you want that vaccine card to stay in its native form. That's the purpose of taking a picture and photocopying the vaccine form. Okay. Okay. One question I get is that um, the federal government developed the vaccine and it's being um, pushed in the, in the black and minority communities because the federal government wants to implant microchips in the individuals and track them. So I think about why would the federal government go through creating a pandemic, ruining the economy to implant mic microchips into people when everyone on earth has a cell phone? If, if something like that want, could happen, that would be more likely because most people are addicted to their cell phones and they pull them up minute they wake up and it's the last thing they do and they go to sleep. If you leave home, you turn around, you go get your cell phone. The kids even have a cell phone. So um, be careful of the things that you hear and read on, on social media. A lot of those things are intended to scare um, minority individuals into not getting the vaccine. And we know the, the, the numbers have shown, if you just watch the news, that black and brown individuals, minorities, suffer more from COVID and are likely to die from COVID because we have pre-existing health conditions. We may not have had adequate health care prior to um, contracting COVID, which makes us more likely to get sick and be hospitalized and place on a vax on a ventilator and perhaps pass away. We make up a large percentage of the um, 500,000 individuals who have passed away, black and brown communities of people. I'm going to go back to why the vaccine was seemingly developed so quickly. And that is because no other time in the recent 50, 60, 70, 100 years, has there been a pandemic? The last pandemic was um, the, the 1918 uh, flu. That's been almost uh, 100 years ago. So any other time a vaccine has been developed since 1918 or any other type of um, health threat has came or um, existed, all eyes were not watching. All eyes were not watching the news. It's the first thing we heard when we turned on the TV, when we got in our car to listen to the radio, when you fl flip open any article on social media. All eyes have been glued to anything involving the pandemic. So it was newsworthy. So, of course, the news outlets and others would be reporting what's going on with what's going on, which was COVID. It's really nothing much else to report about and the vaccine because everyone was on pins and needles and waiting for the vaccine to be developed because like you and me we we want this pandemic to be over and the medical treatment 
was not faring well. That's why we had so many large numbers of people dying. So there needed to be a vaccine. So the government had to act quickly. It's for our public health and our safety. And that's what we pay our taxes for, for the government to protect their citizens. So getting back to why it was developed, it wasn't developed quickly. It was the same amount of time, but the technology to develop the vaccine was used like super fast computers to um, analyze all the data, the 40,000 individuals from Pfizer in the, in the clinical trial, the 30,000 from Moderna, the 43,000 from Johnson & Johnson. Super fast computers were used to analyze the data and generate information to make informed decisions on the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. In addition, the government enacted the Defense Production Act. The Defense Production Act is used by the um, Department of Defense, the military, to make things that are needed right now faster than they typically would be needed. If you would notice that some of the companies that sold alcohol were converted over to entities to make hand sanitizer. Some of the um, factories that made cars were making ventilators. That was all part of the Defense Production Act. In addition, there were an uh, increase of syringes made to administer the vaccines, bottles made to store the vaccine, manufacturing capacity, shipping capacity. All those things were enacted by the president signing the Defense Production Act. In addition, the government paid the money to the vaccine companies to ramp up their development. Because to develop a vaccine, the pharmaceutical companies have to identify and enroll individuals to volunteer. They have to identify clinical sites and locations and the researchers and the computers. They pretty much have to set up shop. So, which takes um, quite a number of years for vaccine companies to raise monies from their, their shareholders to develop a vaccine. That usually takes about five or more years to raise the funding on the front end. Then there's another few years of development and clinical trials. Then the, after the clinical trial phase three shows to be successful, then the vaccine companies have to submit the application to get the vaccine approved to the Food and Drug Administration, and which that can usually take several years. Because there was a pandemic, we didn't have 10 years, 12 years to wait for a vaccine to be developed. If so, we'd still be in year one of the pandemic and it would be as worse than it was a year ago. So the government took the risk and used our tax dollars to fund the stand up of these pharmaceutical companies so they can begin their clinical trials, um, recruit the individuals, all those things that I just mentioned. And then in addition, the Food and Drug Administration moved a lot of their resources over to reviewing the applications to, that allow the vaccines to get emergency use authorization. They moved their resources to review those applications for emergency use authorization and made them a priority and put other drug applications on hold. That is how the government acted on our behalf. That is why the vaccine is of no cost to you, neither is the COVID testing is of no cost to you because our tax dollars are paying for it. It's not that the government is seeking to push something on, the, on its citizens to cause harm. I'm gonna go to um, side effects of the vaccine. I've heard people say that they'd rather get, take their chances and get the vaccine, get the, the virus, and not get the vaccine. The side effects of the vaccine are pretty minimal and general side effects that you get with any vaccine, typically. If you've ever gotten a tetanus shot, you've had a sore arm for a few days, maybe three, four, five days. You just need to move your arm, put a warm or cold compress on it. You may have gotten a flu shot and you feel like, man, you got the flu right after that. A few days later, you get the body aches, you get the chills, you get the headache, you're just tired, you need to sleep. 
you may have some nausea, some diarrhea, just for a few days, and then you're well. Those are some of the side effects with the COVID vaccine, and that, those side effects aren't experienced by everyone. It depends. Now, to treat those side effects, you can use common household remedies such as um, Tylenol or ibuprofen if they're not contraindicated for you, if they're something that you can take. And good old-fashioned rest, mainly just to lay down and rest. After I got my vaccine, I got the Pfizer vaccine about the three hours after I got my first dose, I just got really, really tired. And I lay down and I took a nap for about six hours and I woke up and I was fine. My son is um, 17. He received the, the Pfizer dose as well. After his second dose, he felt the same way and he slept about a whole day, but he is a teenager, so that was probably part of why he's sleeping as well, a growing teenager. He was really tired, and I just said, hon, go to sleep. He had a headache. We gave him some Tylenol. He had a, maybe a couple of doses of Tylenol, because Tylenol you can take every four hours, and he was fine. Now, there is some anxiety with getting the vaccine. I must admit, I'm a nurse. I'm on the COVID clinical team, and just... Um, Getting my appointment, I was just overwhelmed. I was happy that I got an appointment, that I registered, and it took a couple of weeks to get my appointment. But once I got the appointment, I got several others because I registered at many places. But today, the vaccine is more readily available. A lot of places you don't have to register. You can walk up and get the vaccine. Just make sure you go back and get your second dose if that is a two-dose regimen that you have because you want to get the most effectiveness. The research has shown that the vaccine right now is effective for about six to nine months. Because the vaccine is so new, it hasn't been used in as long enough to know anything outside of six to nine months, okay? And there are variants that are occurring. And what is a variant? A variant is a mutation. Um, it's when the vaccine gets stronger and stronger. So the vaccines protect against the variants. And two of the, several of the vaccine companies, I believe all three, are looking into a booster shot for the variants. Because there is some protection, but there could be more. And those are our tax dollars still at work for us. Now, those individuals who are not vaccinated are highly at risk for um, contracting a variant. And a COVID variant is 30 to 50 times stronger than the original COVID that surfaced last year in January. So you are likely to get a stronger um, case of COVID and it may affect you worse than it affected individuals when COVID was fairly new. So that is a, a reason to think seriously about the vaccine and what could happen if you don't get, if you're like those individuals who say, I don't trust the government or I'd rather get the, take my chances and get COVID versus the vaccine. To date, the the vax there are, are not any deaths tied to the vaccine. There are deaths that have occurred for individuals who have gotten vaccinated, but the causality has not been tracked back to the vaccine. Okay. It's no more deaths than would have occurred in the general population if there were not a COVID, if we weren't in a pandemic. We also get a question if about your immigration status. Will my immigration status be checked? for me to get the vaccine. Is that required? No, that is not required. The immigration status does not weigh into protecting you and getting the vaccine. Now, if you want to know where to find, where to get the vaccine, you can go to vaccines, V-A-C-C-I-N-E-S dot gov, and you'll enter in your zip code, and what will come up is information on where the vaccine is available nearest to you, and which vaccine it is. So you get to choose which vaccine you want to receive, the Pfizer, the Moderna, or the Johnson & Johnson, or known as the J&J. &J. Also, if you need 
if you don't speak English and you speak another language, you can also find that on vaccines.gov as well. There's a number there for a translator who can help you find a vaccine in, nearest to you as well. I'm looking at a few more questions. We get questions um, regarding pregnant women. Is the vaccine safe for pregnant women? The CDC says the vaccine is safe as well as ACOG, the American College of Gynecology. In fact, there was a study done um, in the, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a study of 35,000 pregnant women found no major safety concerns for women or their infants when the vaccine was administered during the third trimester. Okay. We also get a question of individuals with cancer or autoimmune diseases who have a um, suppressed immune system. Is the vaccine safe? The vaccine is safe for individuals with a suppressed immune system. However, what is not known is still the effects of COVID on those individuals because your immune system is already suppressed. So if you were to get COVID, you could get really sick. So you're advised to speak with your medical provider about getting the vaccine and your personal protective equipment. You may still have to continue to wear a mask after you are fully vaccinated. Now, speaking of masks, you may know um, as of last night, it was breaking news that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention updated its guidance based on the science. And that guidance is now that individuals who are fully vaccinated do not have to wear masks indoors or outdoors. Neither do you have to physically distance at six feet apart. You don't have to physically distance anymore. You can travel domestically. You can travel internationally without the quarantine. You don't need a COVID test if you are exposed to someone with COVID unless you are symptomatic, meaning unless you have the headache, the fevers, the chills, the shortness of breath, the COVID symptoms. Now, for the what it means to be fully vaccinated is that you've gotten your full dose of the vaccine, either the one dose or the two dose series, and there has been 14 days, two weeks, 14 days after your last, after you finish your vaccine series. That is the definition of fully vaccinated. Now, for those individuals who have not gotten the vaccine or are not fully vaccinated, you are still required to wear your mask indoors, outdoors, around people. Um, physically distance yourself. Now, what CDC has said is um, if you go into areas of crowded places like concerts, I imagine, or street festivals are there are a lot of people, because you don't know who's vaccinated and who's unvaccinated, you may want to wear your mask because although you're fully vaccinated, we can still contract COVID and have no symptoms or little symptoms. And that means we can spread COVID. We can spread COVID to those most vulnerable right now who are the children and the young adults. And I say that those are the most vulnerable because most of those um, 65 and older, the seniors, they were priority for the vaccine. They've been vaccinated. That's why Individuals are able to visit their loved ones now in nursing homes or senior, senior living facilities. They've been vaccinated early on. Now, the group that have not been vaccinated are the, the, the children to teenagers up to the 20-something, 20 20-year-olds. 20 so they're the population who will be most likely to contract COVID and to spread COVID. And because of a lot of young adults and children are asymptomatic, they don't have any symptoms of COVID, they can easily spread COVID unknowingly. Okay. So please be mindful of that. And you also know that Pfizer was approved this week to administer um, the vaccine to children 12 to 15. And that is being done uh, 
right in our local neighborhoods. So you can also find where your teenager can be vaccinated on vaccines.gov. Just checking my notes for a little bit more. And also news this week, the Pfizer vaccine actually submitted, the corporation submitted their vaccine for full FDA approval. Right now, the vaccines, the three vaccines have emergency use approval, emergency use authorization. And what that authorization was just to um, allow authorization because there was a pandemic and the clinical trials showed the safety and effect efficaciness, effectiveness. Now, the same data will be submitted, but more because there have been more time. Pfizer and Moderna, I believe, um, came on the market in about January, if I may be mistaken. So there's been more time to collect more data. Now, individuals want to know what are the studies showing for the long-term effects? That's a, a, one of the major reasons individuals are hesitant to get the vaccine, the long-term effects. So when the vaccine companies submit their application for emergency use authorization or approval to the FDA, they are required to include a pharmacovigilant plan. And in that plan, they must show and describe in great detail how will they continue to study and track the individuals in the clinical trials, those 35 to 45 thousand individuals. How will they track them? And what will they do with the data? How will they analyze it? And, and there are reporting requirements to, back to the Food and Drug Administration to hold the pharmacology companies um, responsible for doing their part, showing that they are doing the long-term tracking. In addition, when individuals like you and I go get the vaccine, you get a, a leaflet and in that leaflet, it has a name of an app that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has. We call V-Safe. So you download that app, or you, I don't even think I download it. You get a text. You put your phone in, you get a text, okay? And I, I've gotten a text after my first dose. I signed up. You get a, I got a text every day for about two weeks four or five questions, how are you feeling? Have you had anything to happen to you that keep you from working? Are you having any symptoms or side effects? It takes about less than a minute to answer. After my second dose, although my second dose has been since April 22nd, I still get a text to click on the link to answer the quick survey. But now that it's been two weeks, I believe, I mean, two a month now, I get a text like once a week now. So my information, your information, when you respond to this text for VSAFE, it goes into that system. It's a part of understand, helping to understand the side effects of the vaccine, the effects after you get the vaccine. So we can all do our part and do this. So I encourage you, if you've gotten a vaccine and you didn't enroll in VSAFE, you can still do that. It'll ask you which manufacturer vaccine you had, what date you had it, and it'll meet computations, and then you'll get a, a, a friendly text um, every so periodically. In addition, there are other six systems that are available for reporting vaccine side effects that are used by um, healthcare providers and the general public. So all this accumulation of data is how the, we will be able to understand the long-term effects of the vaccine, the benefits of the vaccine, what happens to we individuals who get vaccinated. How much time we have, Pastor? 754. I think um, I'm just going to skim my notes real quick, make sure I, I caught everything. We can start um, typing in a few questions in the chat. We do have about 10 minutes. Is that okay, Pastor? Remember, Pastor is manning the, he's manning the chat, so you know, take it easy on him. Okay. <laughs> All right. And something interesting I just learned, the Moderna vaccine was co-developed by the National Institutes of Health. That's the government. That's our tax dollars at work. And the 
scientific lead at NIH is a black female from Hillsboro, North Carolina, um, Kizzy Corbett. Her name is uh, Kizmi Dr. Kizmikia Corbett. She actually um, had been working on the mRNA, the messenger RNA vaccine, the profile for six years before the pandemic. And she said that um, she'd had experience with the SARS and MERS, it's one of the coronaviruses. And they knew that it had, the coronavirus had pandemic potential and they were prepared. They fundamentally understood what the messenger RNA did and how valuable it was. And they were ready to act when it was ready to be used. So that is also more information to help you understand how the vaccine was developed and what we may have seen as a short amount of time. Because at no other time have our eyes been glued to um, vaccines. We're all scientists now to a certain extent, thanks to COVID. Questions, sir? Okay. Let me um, see what else I can share with you. Children. A lot of the questions I, hold on. Oh, getting your vaccine, your second dose. Do you have to go to the same location? Yes. Although there are a lot of places don't require appointments anymore, go back to the same place you got your first dose until you hear otherwise. Because what they do, they, that's how they manage their, their supply. They know that on this date, these many individuals are due to come back for the second dose, so they have that, back, that supply ready. What we don't want is vaccine to be waste. And because there's so much hesitancy and fear, there's a lot of vaccine being wasted now. You know, initially it was um, people getting fired from their jobs because they were taking vaccine home to their family members to get vaccinated. Now these same places are having to waste vaccine, and there's still a pandemic. Only, as Pastor mentioned, 50% of Marylanders have been vaccinated, have received their first vaccine. So we still have a ways to go. It is still a pandemic. It is hot out. It's getting warm. We have the holidays coming up. We have cookouts. We have graduations. We want to get back to normal. Getting back to normal means getting vaccinated so that you can't contract COVID and you don't pass it to anyone else. So the three V's of vaccination, I want you to remember. Well, vaccination, ventilation, and variants. We want the vaccination. We don't want it to catch a variant because it's stronger than the initial strand of COVID. And the longer it's out, the stronger it gets. It mutates. And we definitely don't want to be ventilated. When you're ventilated, that means your lungs aren't working. That means you have a machine pumping air in and out of your lungs to sustain your life. The individuals who are, have to go to the hospital and are ventilated have a decreased chance of life because you're seriously ill when you go to the hospital and you're put on a ventilator. There, there is difficulty weaning, meaning I'm getting you off the ventilator. In addition to my work at DHS, I... And I, I attend um, clinical rounds of clinicians all around the, the world who are discussing care of patients with COVID because it's so new. What COVID does to the body is so new. So COVID causes the cytokine storm. Those are the blood clots. And COVID initially was thought of as a respiratory virus. It is respiratory. You inhale it. That's how we contract it. But once it gets into the body, the COVID virus attacks all the organs. There has been an increase in strokes. Okay, I have a question. Heart attacks, kidney failure, amputations. Um, you heard the COVID toes, the COVID fingers, they turn blue. That's because those are the blood clots clotting off the circulation and causing the amputations. I'm going to stop here. There's a question. There's a question from Diane. She received her first dose on February 24th and her second dose a month later on March 24th. 
And given that it was 30 days from the dose one, does this, uh, from dose one to close, um, she wants to know, is she fully vaccinated? According to CDC, according to CDC, you are fully vaccinated. Remember, I mentioned initially the Moderna vaccine is 28 days after the first dose. So if you get 30 days, that would be just two days after the Moderna vaccine. Your second dose was required. And the Pfizer is 21 days, so that would be nine days. Um, you're not advised to go back and repeat the, the series because you may have lapsed, what, could have been nine days or two days, depending on which of the vaccines you received, Pfizer or Moderna. So, yes, 14 days post that second dose, you are fully vaccinated. All right. We have a comment, not a question. Uh, this is from Harry. He says, good information. Thank you for taking the time to provide us with this valuable knowledge to make an informed decision about vaccinations. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. As Pastor said, our theme for the year before last was um, use what you have to change the world. So I'm a nurse, been a nurse 26 years. I'm a nurse for a reason, and this is what I have, and I want to use what I have to help others. And if it changes the world, that's even better. All right. I think overall, um, Latasha, the comments were that you've done a great job in presentation. Uh, they fully enjoyed the information that you've provided. Uh, one of the things I do want to kind of raise, and that is to um, put before those who are still um, on the fence about deciding um, that currently, being that so many people are being vaccinated, they are actually at the highest risk at this point. They're enduring the highest risk by not being vaccinated. Is that correct? Correct. Because the vaccine rates are going up with individuals getting vaccinated, you may see that hospitalizations are going down. But if you're not vaccinated, you are at high risk to, of getting COVID because so many people around you have the vaccine. So the, the virus cannot thrive in individuals who are vaccinated. The virus needs a host that is unvaccinated. So you're exposing yourself and putting yourself at higher risk, even if you're wearing the mask, doing the physical distancing, washing your hands, using the hand sanitizer, not going in crowded places. The vaccine is, has gotten stronger, as I mentioned. The, vi the variants, also known as mutations, are 30 to 50 times stronger than the original strand of COVID vaccine that was discovered back January 2020. Janet wants to know how old is too old to be vaccinated? The first person to get the vaccine was 92 years old. So you cannot, there's no how old is too old. That hasn't been documented or, or stated or recommended. If you have um, breath in your body, life in your body, you are a candidate for the vaccine. You need to consider getting the vaccine. And the older you are, you, we, as we know, you're, you're more likely to get sicker from things, particularly uh, that a virus that is so is deadly and has mutated 30 to 50 times more. Excellent. I, I'm, I think you've done a great job. I think we've accomplished uh, what we sought out to do here, and that is to provide wisdom for those who have sought wisdom from God. And uh, hopefully it has helped people to be able to make informed decisions about getting the vaccine and currently vaccines are being made readily available and because of some of the hesitancy I've also heard that in some states and municipalities they are now removing the uh, required or the allocated vaccines they're denying the allocation for their state or municipality because of the low rate of yeah. uh, acceptance or the, the multiplicity of, of Hesitancy. So the hesitancy is also ultimately going to make it harder for you to get it in your municipality. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, because areas are not 
requesting large volumes of vaccine because they're not getting the numbers that we were originally with people flooding. I live by Six Flags. There was a line on Church Road and a line on Central Avenue. I couldn't even get out of my neighborhood because there were so many people trying to get the vaccine. That any day there are 12 police and sheriff manning the traffic. We couldn't even get through a, a traffic light. But now that is no longer the case. Um, now it's only two police cars there. There's no long line. So people have really relaxed about getting the vaccine. The people who wanted the vaccine have gotten it. The people who are hesitant are still hesitant to the point that supply is being um, decreased or it's not the same supplies were requested anymore and supplies being wasted. So what that's going to end up being, the pharmaceutical companies are going to stop producing. It's going to decrease production. Production is going to be decreased. Vaccine supply is going to become low, and then you're going to have to really search to find a vaccine. So it will be to your benefit to get the vaccine while it is readily available because is it, the thought is that COVID will unlikely go away. COVID will be um, like the flu or be like a measles outbreak that comes about every so often, and we have to protect ourselves. Now, this is the Real, our real first summer with COVID and being vaccinated and people are already going out in groves. So the researchers are thinking that the winter is, winter is going to be challenging if individuals do not continue to get vaccinated, if we can't get the people who are undecided off the fence to get vaccinated. So we don't want to go into a winter unvaccinated or pretty much unprepared. Okay, I have another question here from Reginald. Uh, I do believe you may have answered this already. How long does the uh, dose last? I think full vaccination, you said, from current data is six to nine months. And that's only because we've only had six to nine months of experience of it. Uh, Delena asked a question. She says, my nephew is stationed in Florida and has COVID but no vaccine. The doctor sent him home and told him to go back to work, but he still has shortness of breath and headaches. How soon can he get vax, the vaccine shot after the COVID virus? It's recommended to get vaccinated 30 days after you've had been positive for COVID. Once you're positive for COVID, you have antibodies. So you have COVID in your body. So you're, you're protected. But those antibodies um, decrease and go back down to zero. So then you are unprotected. So about 30 days after being positive for COVID, he'll get a, he should get, go back and get tested, make sure he's negative before he gets the COVID vaccine and then get the COVID vaccine. And like she mentioned, there's a, I believe there's a shortage in Florida. My nephew was going from North Carolina to Florida to get the COVID vaccine and they called around and couldn't find it in Florida. So he ended up having to get the vaccine in North Carolina before he went to Florida. I wanna say one thing about the side effects of COVID. Um, the COVID virus may also come with what's called uh, the long haul COVID. I actually know um, people who have the long haul COVID. So they have um, one individual was diagnosed with COVID last June or July. And this person is still on oxygen because the damage COVID did to um, their lungs. So you have people who are still really tired, have the exertion, um, months now up to a year after the COVID. Um, it's thought that COVID also triggers an autoimmune response in some people. And this is why they have the prolonged symptoms of the COVID. Okay, excellent. Um, and I think you answered Horace's question. Um, that happens to be Mr. Mr. Leslie. Uh, in terms of the post-COVID ailments that people have uh, been documented to have so far, uh, and will you ever have to be uh, to get it every? Or will you have to get it every year? Is another question, and I think you may have answered that as well. There's boosters being produced. But. Boosters are being produced, and that research is still underway. But that is what the research is leaning towards. That it's likely that we'll need a a booster 
for COVID on an annual basis because it's not anticipated that COVID is going to go away. Remember, the coronavirus is not new. COVID is the seventh coronavirus. It's the only coronavirus that has caused a pandemic prior to the COVID pandemic being declared in March of 2020. There was the the MERS COVID, that's the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, that was over in the Middle East. That was in um, 2016, no, 2019. And um, working at Homeland Security, our job is um, public health security as well. So we've I've worked the, the MERS, um, SARS exposure, and also the H1N1, Zika, Ebola, all these these pandemics that have occurred by, or or endemics epidemics that have occurred so these things aren't this type of work isn't new to homeland security although a lot of individuals may think of homeland security as a, a law enforcement policing agent which we are but we have a large nexus and um, equities in the public health securities um, I think the last question here will take, uh, why does the CDC say 90 days before you can get the vaccine if you test it positive? Um, so the research is continually changing because they may have followed individuals who have COVID and tested their blood on increments to see when do the antibodies drop off. So, so some individuals' antibodies can drop off at 30 days. Some can drop off at 90 days. So 30 to 90 days is okay. But the point is that if you are have been COVID positive, you do not get a vaccine while you're still positive. You wait. Typically, we what we recommend is that you don't even return back to work. It was 14 days. So there's another two weeks. That was 30 days. So by 30 days, you should be free of your COVID infection and well enough to get vaccinated. So up to 90 days, that, that is, that's still reasonable. Well, thank you, Ms. Leslie. You might have, you have a seat there and we'll give us to the end of this journey. Um, hopefully you all have enjoyed this information so far and um, all that Sister Leslie has shared with us is invaluable uh, information and insight. And one of the things, many of you know, um, I actually had the COVID virus and um, she's correct in terms of the, the information shifting because actually once we had it, uh, my wife and I, we were told 30 days. Uh, we had it in January. And so at that time it was 30, it was 30 days um, before you could you know, get the vaccine. We now have both been fully vaccinated um, as yourself as well. And so, um, and another thing I will point out for those of you who are still hesitant and still kind of on the fence and still considering um, getting the vaccine, um, as we shared earlier, you're at the highest risk because everybody else is getting the vaccine. But secondly, just a note, on my way here tonight, um, and many of you know I have a lot of adopted children. Uh, one of my adopted children, um, I found out she has an appointment for Monday to get her vaccination and didn't feel well earlier today, went and got tested, and guess what? Now she has the COVID virus. And I'm going to tell you this. Um, I, I didn't have a severe case of COVID vaccine, uh, vac uh, virus, I'm sorry, COVID virus, but um, I would not encourage anyone to take their chances at having it. It is not a pleasant experience, even when you don't have the severe version of it. Uh, and I think the, the hesitancy can cost you, as um, one of my children I shared uh, tested positive today, and that's about the third or fourth person that I've heard that happen to in the last three weeks. Um, who had an appointment to go because they waited and delayed and delayed. And then finally they said, oh, you know what, I'm going to go. And then before they got there, they actually tested positive. So uh, don't procrastinate. Um, <laughs> uh, as I say, uh, you have the choice of vaccinate or ventilate, and I think vaccination will be far better. Um, Sister Leslie, any last and final words you have? I know everyone wants to make the right decision regarding getting vaccinated and it's understandably to have some hesitancy is 
just living amongst a pandemic is very scary, even for a seasoned provider, healthcare professional like me who have seen people at their worst. And I just share this information to help you to make the best decision for you and your family and those around you. Um, we're still in a pandemic. Don't let your guard down. Continue to wear your mask. Keep your distance. Wash your hands particularly those individuals who are not vaccinated. As of today, we fully vaccinated people don't have to do that. That is just how much certainty there is about the effectiveness and has been shown regarding the effectiveness of the vaccine. So it's definitely a sigh of relief to me. Um, after I got my vaccine, I actually, um, I actually cried. Um, and I said a prayer for all the individuals who weren't able to get the vaccine and had passed away. And at that point, it was still um, 500,000. And I felt like I just got the golden ticket. So um, maybe you will have that feeling too if you get the vaccine. It takes a lot of worry and anxiety um, out of my day just knowing that um, I'm protected and I am, I'm, I'm well. And I just pray um, for you with your hesitancy that um, my question, my information was helpful to answer um, questions or at least to help you to start thinking or looking more um, towards um, getting the vaccine. And I just want to thank Pastor for this opportunity. Bless you, bless you, bless you. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in with us tonight. I'm going to pray for us all as we close out on this evening, as always. And we're grateful for your presence on tonight. And we look forward uh, for you coming and joining. Uh, I think you still have our, our opportunity to join us on Sunday for worship. We're still doing the RSVP. Uh, and so you have an opportunity to, to join us on Sunday morning for worship. It is going to be Men's Day on this coming Sunday. So we'd love to see our men come out uh, in great numbers numbers uh, to fill the house to our 15% uh, capacity that we're still at right now. Our task force will be meeting as a result of all the information that's coming out with our county and state, and we want to get on point with that. But currently we're doing 15%, which is far below the uh, allowable amount, uh, and I'm sure we'll be looking at uh, how we can continue to grow that and get back towards normalcy as the days and months Come. So let's look together in, in prayer as we close out for this evening. Eternal and everlasting God, thank you for everything that you're doing in the lives of your people. Thank you, God, that we can pray. We can seek your face. We can ask for wisdom. And God, we never know how you're going to provide it. But tonight you've provided it through our sister, Sister Latasha Levesley. And God, uh, we didn't have to go far. She was right here in our midst. And she uh, was a willing vessel to, to share the insights and information and that she's been equipped to, uh, to share around the world and through the Homeland Security. And we're thankful for her tonight, God. And I just pray your blessing upon her and her family as they continue to do your work and your will and as she uh, has uh, positioned herself as a frontliner uh, to, to shield and, and lead the way. So thank you for her and thank you for her efforts tonight. Thank you for her information, her insight, uh, for just blessing so many people that are listening now and who will listen later. Father, I'm praying that even those that are listening will have uh, gained such great information that they will be excited about sharing it with their other family members and friends that they might also be able to tune back into the website or to our Facebook page or archived or, or through the um, YouTube or whatever other means, God, that this uh, uh, information is, is going to be platformed. And so, God, tonight, I just pray for each and every one who is under the sound of my voice. God, I ask that you would give grace to each one in their decision making as they make their decision about uh, being vaccinated or not. I pray for those who have been vaccinated, Lord God, that they might continue to walk and, and live in wisdom. And I pray for those who have not yet become vaccinated and for those who, who can't be vaccinated because of uh, certain conditions of health that they may have. Lord, and we just pray for our children, Lord God, as they are interacting with one another and just praying your grace will be a covering grace upon them as well. For those, Lord God, that are already uh, sick and still in hospitals and still recovering, those long haulers, we pray for them. Tonight, God, we just pray, Lord, that your will will be done, your way will be accomplished, and your grace will be imparted in such a way that each person, God, will know that the hand of God has been on their life. God, I don't know all the issues and all the concerns of everyone who's listening, but I know that you know them all. 
And so I place them in your hands. I ask your grace and your mercy be with them and your hedge of protection be all around them. Guide each and every one of us and keep us in the center of your holy and divine will. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we thank you tonight. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And thanks again for hanging out with us. Good night.